Sorry, mais wow, je crois que les autres ont entendu. Là, à 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Moi je vais me mettre en arabe. Tu entends si je fais ça Ouais. Uh, time is money, you know. <laughs>
Jeff, are you here? If anybody sees G Yeah, come on up, yeah. We're waiting for one more panelist. Oh, there's Jeff. Okay, good. Okay, let me make sure I get everybody's name in order where they're sitting. There's Jeff, um, Philippine, um, Victoria. Monica, so do I have 440, this is pretty good. Yeah, I just want to make sure I get the names all right. I, this is the order, right? Don't worry about spelling, but three and a half now, Monica. You get those in the right order? Uh, Everybody? Victoria, Swafna. Yes. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me? Is my microphone on? Okay, great. Well, welcome to our session. It's a obviously an unpleasant topic that unfortunately we're forced to deal with in, in the world, but I think we can at least in the next 90 minutes get a better understanding of the problem not only of teen suicide but of self-harm in general and mental health in specifics, uh, but also hopefully some solutions. So when we leave here we can take something that's dark and, and very sad and maybe have an optimistic approach as to how collectively we can all do our best to, to turn the tide. Uh, what prompted us to do this session is that for many years the suicide rate in general and especially among teens was actually on the decline. And I remember being in, in, I've been in the internet safety world since the 90s. I'm the old man of the panel and probably the room. Um, and I was always very optimistic and happy to point out that as the internet rose in popularity, there was actually an inverse relationship with many of the problems associated among young people. There was less crime among young youth, uh, less violence among youth, even bullying, which we think is becoming an epidemic, actually kind of leveled off and didn't really go up during the, the rise of the internet. But over the last few years, really maybe since about 1914, 19, 2014, we've seen an unfortunate reversal with um, uh, certainly suicide. Not a huge spike uh, in terms of actual numbers, but statistically, significant growth uh, in, in that area. I'm looking at a chart from um, the Centers for Disease Control, so this is US based, and in 2000 there was, let me see if I get this number up, of course my computer's not working. Well, it went up by almost double between 2000 and 2016. So we're seeing an increase uh, in terms of uh, the number of people uh, that, are, that are taking their own lives among youth. Um, so why is that? and what can we do about it? And there's a lot of speculation. Uh, there are those who put the problem squarely at the foot of technology, the internet, and social media. And it's very easy to hypothesize and to say, well, uh, more people are being cyberbullied, and more people are having to deal with image issues. They go on Instagram and they think everybody looks beautiful except them. Um, they go on social media and they find out all their friends are having parties and they're not invited. Uh, it's very easy to say that's the cause, but it's not clear. I mean, we don't know that it, that it plays no role, but based on the research I've looked at, there's no definitive proof that it is indeed the cause, because there are other things that happen. The economy gets better and gets worse. Um, mental illness uh, has always been a factor and, and often is a factor in suicides. And then you also have to look at why two people can e experience exactly the same trauma and one person is resilient enough to bounce back and, and thrive, and the other person is severely affected and extremely depressed and, and may harm themselves or even take their own life. And what is the difference between those two people? The actual event may have been identical or very similar, but the results can be very different. So you have to look at all of the factors that go into how a person responds uh, to adverse conditions that all of us on one level or another are gonna face throughout our lives. Why do some uh, very few, but some go the ultimate desperation and take their lives, and others 
eventually bounce back? So these are really important questions that I certainly like the panel to think about and also like the folks in the audience to think about because there's going to be time for not only questions and answers but comments and uh, hopefully smart um, uh, contributions from people in the room. So I'm looking forward to that. Now, one of the things I've decided to do is to make my life easier and partially because uh, there are names on this panel that I am going to mispronounce no matter how hard to try, is to introduce everyone by first name and let them give you their full name and also talk a little bit about what they do, who they are, uh, and then I'm going to ask them some questions and then we will break into a discussion. So I think I'll go in the order in which we're seated. Uh, Jeff Collins, who I can introduce by full name, is my co-organizer uh, of the uh, event, so thank him for many of the things that go right today and blame me for everything that goes wrong. But Jeff, we'll talk a little bit about yourself and, and why you felt strongly about doing this. Sure, thanks Larry, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I thought I'd just give a little bit of background on uh, the company I work for because I think most of you probably aren't familiar with our company. So our, our main product is called After School, and it's a social network for high school students only in the U.S. Um, and I'll go ahead and just give a little bit of backstory because I, I think this kind of gets to the reason, uh, the explanation of why we care about this topic. So with tech companies, we're, we're a small startup. Uh, we have about 15 people. And when our two young co-founders started the company, I think like many tech companies, they have very positive goals. They're optimistic people. Um, I mean, if you look at the huge companies like Facebook, Google, it's the same story. I mean, you can you know the founders have good intentions, and you know they still do. But now we know that the reality is there's a lot of unintended consequences um, that happen from something as simple as a social network. So, our app was founded about three years ago, and it allows high school students to communicate anonymously with other students in their high school. And it was kind of a, a tweaked version of a different product they had in college, and they were trying to uh, introduce it into high schools, and it took off and it exploded. There were like 200,000 users in a week. Um, it was like one of the most downloaded apps, and it was three people working at the company. Um, and their whole intention was to improve the high school experience, and allowing the ability to communicate anonymously to be used so kids could talk about things that are difficult that they're not going to talk about on a public network like Facebook where everyone you know can see them. So things like uh, mental health problems or coming out as gay. Um, so th a lot of that happened and I'll talk a little later about what we see today. But um, in the first few months as we were exploding in terms of user numbers, um, we also saw tons of cyberbullying, people threatening to commit suicide, and the founders, who at the time were like 23 and 33, uh, you know, they didn't really know how to deal with this. So, um, so we took the app out of the app store, essentially put it on pause um, for like four months, and, es and essentially built in a whole bunch of safety features that are that are standard for for most social networks. So you have moderation, um, technical moderation. So if someone types something like, I'm gonna shoot up the school, that will automatically be blocked. But you also have teams of human moderators and they're looking um, for posts that violate guidelines and blocking them. Um, so we, we kind of shifted and instead of just allowing everything, we decided because of the sensitive nature of the audience, it's young high school kids, that we would take a lot of things down. Um, and so that's kind of the short story of how we got interested in cyberbullying, and that kind of led us to, to this issue of mental health. Um, we are in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, which is um, pretty well known now that there's been some suicide clusters there. It's a very affluent area. Lots of young people have committed suicide over the years. And so there's been a lot of focus on this um, interplay between social media and technology and mental health of teens and teen suicide. So we have connected with um, a number of the expert organizations there and Stanford University has a great program looking at this. Um, and yeah, so that's how, I guess I'll leave it at that for now and we'll get into some of the things we're working on later. 
So Jeff, I'm curious about your moderators. It strikes me as a lot of pressure on these individuals. How, how, are, how do you equip them to know when to take action? Obviously, you don't want to respond to every possible um, indicator, or you'd be you know, referring everybody to a suicide prevention line. How do you know when it's time, or how do your moderators know when it's time to intervene, and, and what, do they, what, in fact, do they do? So that's a good question. So we actually, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we do to use anonymity in a positive way is, as I mentioned, people will, will talk about sensitive things. So they could talk about being depressed. And we actually have technical algorithm that will detect if they may be talking about something that could suggest they have a mental health problem. And if, if that's detected, then they get a pop-up that asks the student if they want to communicate with a, um, with a mental health professional. But we put it in kind of teen language, like, do you want to talk to someone about this? And um, if they say yes, then we refer them to Crisis Text Line. Crisis Text Line is this um, now really big organization, works with Facebooks and works with even city governments like to help prevent people who might be trying to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, but they do uh, counseling over text, which might sound a little odd at first, but that's how young people communicate. So, um, so by detecting things that kids have written, um, we have sent like 20 some thousand kids to crisis text line and they have conversations with trained counselors and then we have something like 30 active saves, which they define as preventing someone who was about to commit suicide from, to help prevent them from doing that. Um, so that, that's the technical part. And then on the human moderators, that is a tough issue because especially the larger companies, essentially they use teams of moderators overseas. And so this is like, a, uh, we used to be troubled about outsourcing of, you know, like the Nike making their shoes in Indonesia. Um, but the tech industry does something similar the really difficult images, we don't have the most difficult because we're teens, but if you think about like beheadings, you know, it's moderators overseas in the Philippines and Honduras that are um, reviewing these things. And so the way we do it is they rate different posts and they decide to take them down, they decide to elevate them to an American. Um, but, but I do, so I think you get to a good point that we and others need to do more um, and I think the larger companies are to ensure that the moderator's mental health is actually, you know, not worsening. So I'm going to ask you another question, but first I want to pull the audience. How many people here work for a private company for industry of any kind? Very few. How many work for government? How many are NGOs? Academia? Anything else? What? I, okay, and Bob, independent programmer. <laughs> we have a very famous American programmer here. He wrote the very first spreadsheet called VisiCalc, so we're honored to have Bob Frankston here. Um, so my next question really, you're a private company. You're, you know, and I presume neither of your founders are psychologists. I, don't, I know you're a lawyer by trade. Um, why is it your business? I mean, I know, I know the answer to this, but I want to hear it from you. Why you? I mean, normally people who commit suicide, it's government takes care of them or medical institutions take care of them. Now this private company that had no intention of being in that business is in the business of having to prevent suicides. Yeah, that's, ex that's a really good question. I think, I mean, the, the short answer is because we're kind of on the front lines and so we get a lot of blowback from media and from parents, um, from schools, teachers if there's a lot of bullying happening or if someone commits suicide and they've been posting on your network and you didn't detect it, it's gonna be horrible for you in the media. Um, I mean, that's kind of the business side, but I think there's increasingly in the industry a realization that, um, you know, there is, although we don't have conclusive evidence of causation between use of technology or social media and suicide. I mean, I think all of us know here, and we're gonna hear from a teenager in a second, but we know how much young people, I mean, our kids, our friends use social media and we see how much we ourselves use it. And I, so I think there's an innate understanding that, um, you know, this is changing the way we think. And with young people, it can increase the types of pressure that they have. Um, 
And so I think we feel a responsibility that, mm -hmm. you know, it's really an ethical responsibility that we can't just promote kids using, you know, our app and other apps all day, all night, um, and, you know, using it in negative ways. So we, going back to, to the way I started, you know, the founders have very positive goals using communication for good, and that's what we want to do. And so you can't just go forward blindly in, in order to accomplish that. You have to work with, you know, the diversity of uh, people like we have here today to figure out what's happening, um, to look at the, the science, and then to try to take steps to do things in the right way in your app or on your service so we can use technology for good. Thank you, Jeff. So our next speaker is Philippine. I'm going to let her give her surname and introduce herself. Um, unlike the rest of us, she's actually younger than she looks. I'm not going to give away her age. It's up to her to decide whether to do that. But um, obviously very mature for her, for her age uh, from the little time I've known her. But she has some experiences with, with friends and I think a lot of depth. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Philippine. Thank you. Um, hello. I um, hello, I'm Philippine Balmadi. Um, I'm French and American. I'm 13 years old. Um, I'm bilingual. And I'm in eighth grade. Okay. But talk a little bit about your experiences. So, um, in the previous year, I've had a friend who um, wanted to commit suicide because she didn't feel well in her own skin and she was she was really depressed. So what we tried to do is we tried to make, we tried to help her. So we went to talk to school counselors to ask for advice, to let her talk to them and to try to explain why she was feeling this way. And um, she's okay now. She's, she's happy now. Um, it was really nice for her, but I think that she re that um, social media had a positive and a negative impact on her. For example, um, the negative impact would be that I think that she was able to watch things to do with self-harm and that things that made her very depressed. But then social media kind of let her heal by being able to talk with friends and knowing that she is loved and that she's not alone. Keep your mic open. You're not done yet. Um, was it hard to reach out and help your friend? I mean, did, did you think about it or just was it obvious to you? Did you have to I mean, I wasn't the first person to know about it, but um, we all decided together that we had to do it because if something would have happened to her, we would have felt so awful and we wouldn't have been able to, to live with ourselves. So maybe this is an unfair question because I know you're not a psychologist, at least not yet. But why do you think some kids are vulnerable and others less so? Like why is it that two kids can be both, let's say, bullied and one gets very depressed and the other kind of blows it off? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's experience? maybe like the personalities. Some people are very fragile and take things at heart, but then some people always just push it off and don't really mind. So I think that it kind of depends on the people. Now you all, in a sense, have already proven this is true, but are there things the community can do to help those fragile people become less fragile? I mean, I think that on all social medias, there's always people that post things to do with self-harm. And I think that they, it shouldn't be okay to post things because Everyone else, the people that watch this can get bad ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think that those posts shouldn't be allowed to be posted. Mm -hmm. And, and again, getting back to that notion of, of the upstander versus the bystander, the fact that you didn't stand by and watch your friend do something horrible. What can young people like yourself do to make that contagious, encourage others to, to be like yourself and stand up? Um, I mean, I think we just have to talk about it openly because if we, d if we don't talk about it, then it's just going to become a growing problem. Mm -hmm. I think that if everyone just, if on the media, everyone just starts talking about it more openly and free freely, it will be, it will be considered, it will be considered more okay to talk about than something that we shouldn't talk about. A lot of wisdom. Thank you so much.
Uh, Victoria, again, your last name, where you work, what you do, and a lo little bit of why you, why this issue is so important to you. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, uh, yeah, it's uh, hard to follow. I think you, uh, Felina, sort of raises a lot of really important uh, challenges that a lot of uh, platforms have to have to face and really look ahead to. Um, so I'm Victoria McCullough. I work um, with Tumblr uh, on our most of our social impact work um, in this space. And uh, just a few things I want to mention for those of you who might not be familiar with Tumblr. Um, we are uh, a blogging platform, look, you know, I think very focused on um, and a lot of the content that you'll see, as you think from photos to personal blogs um, to more journal-like en entries um, to just general content creators. So we focus a lot, quite a bit on um, artists and, and content creators and really supporting um, their their efforts uh, to express themselves. So we're very focused on freedom of expression and really having uh, our users bring their whole selves to the platform. Um, a couple of things that I want to point out because it feels important for this conversation are just some features that I think on the platform that are a little bit unique compared to other platforms, but also I think really uh, play a role in this conversation. So a few of those are one that similar to, to Jeff and After School, we place a strong importance on the ability to be anonymous. Um, so I think early on for the last 10 years, we saw a lot of users who did not feel comfortable in their own skin, um, whether it was with their family or their community and felt like Tumblr provided this space that they could be anonymous and really be themselves. Um, the other thing that I think is it, that I don't know that we saw this coming in the last 10 years, but has also been, I think, reflected in our community is the fact that there is no public follower count um, on our platform. Um, so I think most of our users who come here uh, and come to Tumblr talk about not necessarily having that vanity factor. They come just hoping to really connect with people. Um, so one of our our mantras and our missions is around connecting people around their passions and I think a lot of that is is due to uh, Tumblr providing a, a space that that doesn't necessarily um, doesn't mean that you're competing with other friends or even connecting with people uh, that live in your town you're mostly connecting around things that you're really you're interested in and then I think the the other um, the other feature um, it, that is really developed as, as uh, the, from those other two has just been as more of our users have become more comfortable online they often um, sort of speak to they they in this I think this next generation coming up uses many many platforms and finds that uh, and will say that they're often using other platforms maybe it's Facebook or Twitter and that's more of a reflection of maybe their outside self um, and Tumblr is more of a reflection of their inside selves with that challenge I think comes that sometimes our young our younger users the in, their inside self may not uh, may be struggling may struggle with depression anxiety um, maybe still figuring things out. We have we have a large number of LGBTQ youth on our platform that we have been we have focused very much on trying to, to cultivate um, our relationship uh, with them and really cultivating opportunities to reach out to them. But for so many of them who are living in areas where they don't have real like actual resources. Um, that has been something that we've placed a large emphasis on and has, have really seen that community grow um, over, uh, over the sort of the, uh, the full life of, of Tumblr. And it's really shaped how we as a company think about this outreach in this space. Um, I think as we have seen users really struggle, we have focused on a few different things, um, and then I will, um, I'll pass it off. But, uh, things that I think we need to continue to invest in. But one is we recognize as a platform um, that we have some of these challenges. There are some things, proactive things that we can do. So we focus quite a bit on interventions and just providing things like, not unlike Crisis Text Line, where we provide hotlines that sort of as, as users might search, whether it's self-harm terms or others, but really just trying to put up intervention so that it prevents them from getting to, to some of the material we take down um, and try to be mindful about moderating the types of content that could not, that may be harmful. Um, but more importantly, I think really putting resources in front of our users. Um, and then 
uh, then I, the last piece is in addition to really working to shore up those trust and safety resources and, and making sure that they're re being re as responsive as they can be and providing a lot of the crisis resources that might be helpful, especially uh, when a user is very much in crisis and, and may be on, maybe having suicidal thoughts. I think we as a company have tried to really invest um, in a, from a proactive standpoint around investing in campaigns around mental health. Um, a, several years ago, I believe it was 2015, I think there was a, several, there was a rash of teen suicides. And so you saw a lot of companies um, across the board really invest um, in trying to make their, their platform safe, but also really invest in erasing the, the stigma around mental health conversations. And so we launched something called Post It Forward several years ago, and, honest, and I always am very honest about this, we thought we would, it would be gone in a couple of weeks. We thought this was sort of a campaign that we would, we would respond and provide users and bring users together to talk about these conversations and, and bring resources to the table and shed some light, and then maybe it would, it would evolve into something else. And it turned into one of the most powerful communities on our platform. It was so obvious that I think people were really needing that type of response. And so we've continued to invest, and that's actually, that Post It Forward effort has, I think, really become a part of our DNA uh, as a platform. So it, there are things that, whether it's partnering with mental health organizations that can help us better provide a safe place for our users, or if it's just taking a proactive stance around making sure that in the United States that mental health is a part of that larger healthcare conversation, um, and that more importantly that we're making it a safe space to to really label some of these challenges um, that, that are raised with mental health, whether we're talking about depression or anxiety or, or eating disorders, I think they're, we want to make Tumblr a space that is comfortable um, for every user to really to talk about some of those challenges. So as we move forward um, and looking into next year and beyond, and as we are seeing suicides increase and certainly mental health be something that is, um, that is increasingly challenging, um, I think for this next generation, um, we're looking at additional ways that we can invest in some of those mental health um, uh, resources and really partner with groups um, to, to also show our own responsibility. I think there are a lot of things that we can't do and we can't always do them effectively, but I think we can partner with NGOs um, to really provide and set up some of the supports from whether, how we work with parents to how we work with schools. Um, and uh, so I think those are, those are some of, that's the lay of the land for us, but I think what we see are some of those challenges that we can't solve everything. But. See, you mentioned your, your service is anonymous. A number of years ago I wrote an article called Anonymous is not synonymous with ominous. But having said that, that's my point, a lot of people disagreed that felt that anonymity is a ter terrible thing, that it encourages cyberbullying, it encourages other bad behaviors, you, people aren't accountable yet you've made a deliberate decision to create an anonymous platform. I wonder if you talk for a minute about why you think that's actually a safety feature versus a bug. Yeah, and it doesn't, I won't, I won't say that it's perfect every time, because I, I do think there are definitely examples where this doesn't, this won't work. But I think for a lot of Tumblr, as Tumblr has evolved, what we have seen is an incredibly proactive community. So what happens often is that when they are, they, the community witnesses bullying happening or a bad behavior, they often will police themselves and will often will tend to either uh, collectively support someone that they see being victimized uh, and really get involved. And so that's where it has been, I think, over, to, over the course of, the, of several years, it's really been a, a place that has built up a community of people who will step up and, and speak out and sort of protect. And even to a certain extent, I, I, there's like a, another term that they use, but will often run off some of the bullies and really um, sort of collectively work together to do that. And that's where we've seen some of the better examples. But that's something that I think has come with time. And that brings up my next question. Just as Philippine talked about how she and her community, her physical community, you know, gathered and helped this young woman who was in, basically exhibiting suicidal tendencies, how does that work in an online community? How can you be a friend like Philippine perhaps to somebody you've actually never met, may live in a different part of the world than you do? Well, one of the, we, we often work um, w with several groups who will help us, and you mean just user to user. Yeah, right? I mean user, user to, yeah, you see something and you, you get a feeling that maybe this person needs help and you may know them, you may not. 
Yeah, there are a couple of groups that we've worked with that will encourage users to do something as simple as, you seem like you're not feeling great today. Um, and some uh, language that feels kind of innocuous but doesn't run that other person off or, or make them feel defensive, that it's as simple as saying, hey, are you feeling okay today? And then starting some of that the conversation that way. And then as it escalates, um, and we've, we've worked with partners in the past who have helped us with some of this language, but when it, if it does escalate and it's something that you can't from user to user really address or you feel like you haven't been able to help, uh, they, have, they provide ways and some language and resources that you can then respond and say, hey, this is, here is some, here, you should call this person. This is a great, this is a really great re crisis resource to help you. Um, there's a real person on the other side that, a, a counselor that can really provide that effort um, and, and invest in that. And so I think those are some, that's some of the language that we encourage our users to get comfortable with. But more importantly, I think we try to get them really familiar with mental health organizations in the regions that they live in that can help train them, especially the ones that want to be, want to be helpful. Thank you. So for our next speaker, uh, I'm not even going to try her last name and I'm probably going to get her first name wrong. I'm, I have it as Hefna, Hefna, but she'll, she'll correct me. <laughs> but the main reason I, I brought her here is because I realized that we were lacking one very important component on this panel, which is somebody with a mental health background who can talk from the standpoint of, of mental health as well. We get double duty because she's also very active in the internet safety world as well. So with that as a very brief introduction, you can give me the proper pronunciation of both your first and last name and a little bit what you do and some of the issues. Sure, I'm the, my name is Hrefna Sigurjónsdóttir <laughs> and I'm the general manager of Home and School, which is the National Parent Association in Iceland. It's an NGO working in close relation with other stakeholders, for example, government in educating for better education and well-being of students from ki kindergarten to upper secondary school and onwards really. Um, our aim is to strengthen the relationship between uh, homes and schools for the progress and well-being of the student. Uh, positive experience and connection towards school and education are very important protective factors in the lives of teenagers. Uh, but bad experiences from schooling can be predictive for problems with mental health substance abuse and dropout. So we think this relationship, it's re really important that it's good and that uh, students have a positive experience from their schooling. Um, we have seminars, educational material, helpline and more, but one of the larger projects we conduct is the SAF uh, Safer Internet Awareness Center in Iceland, which is a part of the INSAFE European Network. And we have uh, the No Hate Speech Project as well from the European Council. And there, with these projects, we are working with youth, parents, and teachers. Um, and other stakeholders who, uh, who are uh, concerned about the online well-being of children and youth. Um, we also have a helpline connected to the pro <coughs> sorry, project run by the Red Cross and a hotline conducted by Save the Children in Iceland and the police who collaborate us, with us on this. Um, I used to teach in uh, elementary school about a decade ago and the changes of the environment of children and teenagers in just 10 years is enormous. Uh, Philippine described it very, very well and I'm so happy to have a youth representative here. <laughs> very happy to have you. Um, there have been some media-driven speculations on the role of social media in mental health of young people uh, in Iceland. And most of the, well, most of the news tell us that there's a negative connection. Uh, but the research, it shows a clear connection, but we do not really have concrete evidence uh, on causal factors. And uh, more research is needed, uh, but I will report on recent research from the Icelandic Center for Social Research and Analysis in Iceland, uh, called ICSRA, that indicate this correlation. But we do not know about the causal factors yet, although it is evident that it is important how young people choose to spend their time, and we need to take care of their basic needs. But. Um, 
since we are here talking about the Internet of Trust, I think we also uh, need to recognize the role of media in creating or diminishing trust in our society. Uh, most of the news revolve around something negative, threatening, or potentially dangerous. So the media discussion isn't representing a very positive outlook on society or uh, fostering trust and well-being. Um, the suicidal rate in Iceland is quite high, and especially among young people. It is one of the most leading causes of death among young men in Iceland, and this has raised a lot of concern and efforts are being made to, uh, to meet this need. And we have been strengthening prevention and resources. Uh, but it's also interesting that there were most suicidal attempts at the peak of the economic boom in Iceland right before the crisis. So maybe the boom uh, right before the crisis was more of a stress factor than we realized. Um, as you all know, there are many factors contributing to depression and suicidal thoughts. But um, our approach is that prevention needs to start very early and we need to screen uh, classes. We need to pay attention to the rise in reports about loneliness, anxiety, and sadness among children and young people. Um, and the success and well-being of youth is the main concern of our organization. Thank you. Um, perhaps with your psychologist hat on, there's this notion when, it, when there's a, a, a suicide that follows cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. we've, had many, we've had a few cases in the United States. I don't want to say many because actually the, even though the number of suicides have gone up, it's still, you know, a few per hundred thousand people. It's mm. not huge. But somebody will go on television and they'll say, oh, she was cyberbullied and that's why she committed suicide. Or she, somebody distributed a naked picture of her and that's why she committed suicide. Mm. Now, the one person who can't respond is the person who committed suicide because, yeah. unfortunately, they, they can't say anything. But how much weight do we give to any one incident when we hear about somebody who committed suicide and something bad happened to them. Is it fair to assume that just because something bad happened to them and they committed suicide that there's actually a relationship? You know, that, that yes, there's a correlation, but did, do we have any reason to know that the cyberbullying did or didn't cause the suicide? And how do we understand why some people, the same question I asked Philippe, Philippine, some people can have exactly the same experience and survive and other people can take their life mm -hmm. after that experience? Well, uh, I two questions really. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, bless you. <laughs> I think, uh, of course, there is a relationship, uh, but as you said, we don't really know. We don't have the person here with us to describe it to us. But uh, this is based on resilience. How resilient uh, are the kids who are meeting um, and facing facing these challenges? And one of the best things we could do in prevention is to build resilience with kids. And we have to think of new ways of building resilience because we are living in a totally different society with different challenges. And we also have to give uh, our kids the space to grow and develop. They have to be able to meet challenges and take them head on themselves. We, the parents, we can't always save everything for them. They have to be able to grow and build this resilience. And actually there is a, a big project starting in Iceland. It's uh, connected to the European Upright project. It received a huge grant where there are researchers at the University of Iceland uh, are going to develop educational material and uh, teaching modules and so on for uh, elementary schools in cooperation with the Directorate of Health that are supposed that really have this aim of building resilience uh, and, yeah, stronger persons and stronger self-image. Uh, so, as we know, there are many different contributing factors in suicide. Yeah. And um, each case differs as well. And it's all, you know, a combination of, of uh, yeah, DNA and environment. Y you never know, really. But what we can do is try uh, to open up the discussion, like Philippines said, in society, so it's not a taboo to discuss your mental health and offer ways for people to seek help when they feel badly. 
And as we are going to discuss here, technology can open up some new ways uh, in that sense, especially for people who are vulnerable and maybe don't have good access to healthcare. Um, so it might be a new, there might be new ways in opening that up and also assisting healthcare professionals in uh, tackling these problems. Thank you very much. Uh, our final speaker, don't go away because we're going to have more of a discussion. Everybody here is going to have a chance to talk. Uh, again, I'm going to let her give her last name and what she does, but it's Monica who is really a hero because unfortunately, fortunately Monica is here and I'm glad she is. She's great. Uh, we had another speaker in mind, Karuna Nain from uh, Facebook, uh, who was, uh, had an Indian passport and wasn't able to get a visa in time, but uh, fortunately the Brazilian visa came through. So thank you so much for being here, Monica. You're welcome. Um, so my name is Monica Gizi Rosina, um, and I'm a public policy manager um, based in Sao Paulo. I work for Facebook. Um, I have a very um, hard work today, which is filling in Karuna's shoes. Karuna works um, in California and she develops the programs that I'm going to talk about. So you're in worse hands, but um, I promise you I will try to do my best. Um, and I did not need a visa. That's, um, that's why I was able to come so fast. <laughs> um, so I, I, I would just like to start by, um, I'm not going to introduce Facebook, I'm sure um, in our family of apps. I'm sure most of you know how it works. But I would like to start by saying how, um, how happy I am to have you with us today, Philippine. I think it's, um, it's an honor to be able to hear from you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna base my opening remarks on, on a few of the things you said, if that's all right. Um, and you mentioned that social media can have both negative and positive um, effects. And um, I agree with that. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and walk, um, walk you all through um, what we do um, in order to mitigate the negative effects that it might have, but also how we can strengthen the positive effects. So you mentioned that on the negative side, some of your friends see content online that might um, give them ideas, right? Um, so on Facebook, we have what we call our content policies. And our content policies, they are the rules of what we allow and what we don't allow on Facebook. That's a really hard job. Um, and um, in what it regards to safety, and especially suicide, we do not allow for any content that glorifies self-harm or suicide of any kind. Um, so we, we are getting better at removing that content even before it's reported to us. Um, so the primary way in which people can report content on, um, in which bad content is spotted in Facebook is because our community report that content. And anyone is able to report anything they see on Facebook. It's usually the three dots on top of a post or a picture in which people can, um, you know, say I'm reporting this because it has to do with self-harm or something like that. Um, but we also use our alg algorithms and they help us spot um, potentially suicidal or self-harm materials. Um, the decision to remove that content is always made by a human being, but the algorithms really help us um, filter that, that content to us. Um, so, we have over 20,000 people globally nowadays working on that content and uh, they speak several languages and they are in every region of the globe so that they can work and take action 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and whenever we see content that's related to suicide, it goes way up the line and it, because it's a real priority for us. So removing this bad content is really important for Facebook. Um, however, and, and then I'm talking about content that gives people the, the wrong ideas, right? Um, content that glorifies or incentivizes people to self-harm or suicide. Um, but on the other hand, um, we find, because we talk to experts all the time, that 
um, whenever people um, are in distress, um, especially if they're using live, Facebook Live, for instance, that cutting that line of communication can be worse um, for the person because it removes any chance that that person has of getting help. So um, I get the questions a lot whenever I talk about these issues of why don't you cut the feed to potential suicide um, lives. And we believe it's important to maintain that communication open because it might just be that someone's going to reach out at that moment and that moment's going to be crucial in order to help that person. Um, so on, on the bad side, we try to mitigate bad content by um, enforcing our content policies and removing uh, bad content, but we also want to provide support. And sometimes providing support means leaving that channel of communication open. Um, people come to Facebook to share what matters to them with family, with friends. We do believe that we are a community where people look out for one another, and Facebook can be a place where people can get help through groups and you know, through the communities they, they grow. Um, and we're constantly working on building tools that can help people get more information and also getting help. We have um, partners um, all over the world. We have um, nearly 100 partners with whom we work with. And uh, they work specifically with safety issues. And um, so in most countries, we're able to provide a link, a channel of communication to a local organization that might be able to help that person. So we have several tools. Um, we have, you know, chat window that might pop up. Um, we provide um, a user that we might think is a potential suicide with more information. Um, friends can get through and we're also, we're always all the time making sure that a user that might be a potential suicide uh, knows that this is the local organization that he or she can reach out to um, and also within the community. I'm going to stop here. Um. Thank you. Um, so unless I'm missing something, it seems to me Facebook has sort of three tools when it comes to helping people thrive on the site. Uh, you have the community, friends, people who you interact with. You've got your professional human moderators. And increasingly, you have AI, you have algorithms, you have software. And we know the moderators in the community can sometimes intervene when it comes to a potential suicide victim. Uh, are you working on software that can, you've already mentioned software that can help you find inappropriate content that could encourage or glorify mm -hmm. suicide. But what about being able to spot somebody who's in trouble um, as quickly as you can now spot fake news or, or to some extent or uh, mm -hmm. child sex abuse images or other things that you've done a really good job in, in keeping off the site. Can you find somebody who needs that help? Um, I think we're, we're working to constantly improve um, our algorithms and how they work. We get better as time passes and we learn from our mistakes and from where we get it right. But yeah, I think ideally we would like to get to this place where we're able to provide help um, and not just at that time when a person is um, considering committing suicide, but way beforehand. Um, uh, but I do want to say that um, algorithm nowadays, they help us spot, but we always have a human being behind every decision we make. Yeah, because I mean, the other thing about about reaching out, I mean, sometimes you can get false clues. I mean, sometimes people can say things that make it look like they're in trouble, but they're really not. And it's almost embarrassing yeah. when, when people reach out. On the other hand, you don't want to err the other direction either because a suicide is something you can't reverse. But uh, any thoughts as to, and it, it almost gets back to the question I asked Jeff about the role of a private company. I mean, nobody mm -hmm. elected you or federally funded you to, to do this work. It's something that you your organization, and I actually, my own little nonprofit, Connect Safely, was there at the very beginning. We're the ones who first introduced Facebook staff to suicide prevention experts many years ago. And we were very impressed at how quickly you not only jumped on what we introduced, but expanded it greatly. But 
you know, what is your role and what's not your role? You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not anybody's, you know, uncle or mother. You're, you're just a company out there providing a service, but, and I'm going to leave it, okay. leave it there. So suicide is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 29 um, year olds globally, right? We have 2.3 and growing billion people who are using our, our services and a lot of these people are within this within this range. So um, we feel it's our responsibility, it is, to keep the platform as safe as we possibly can. And we believe that providing help is better than just staying on the safe side and, and not doing anything. I think I'd rather, we'd rather uh, run the risk of maybe having a false uh, offer to help than not taking action when that action was indeed needed. Um, but as I said, if we take up, you know, we, we offer health and, it, and, and it's a false uh, positive, our users usually get back to us with comments. They feel annoyed. And with that, our algorithms keep also yeah, getting smart. better. And our moderators too, for sure. Jeff, you had a comment, yeah. Yeah, just reflecting more on this question about why companies, you know, are dealing, have to work on these issues. Um, it's a good question because we're not experts on mental health or suicide, and so we're not really the ones who should be making the tough calls. So yeah, we err on the side of caution. But I think, it, when I think about this, I think a larger um, problem, and I, of course, am saying this from a U.S. perspective, is um, we have to do something because we're on the front lines. And a lot of times where we're failed here is government. And so in the U.S., as most everybody here knows, we have this decentralized system where the federal national government isn't setting policy on things like cyberbullying. Um, and so what we see is a very ad hoc system where states who control um, policy on cyberbullying and how they're going to work with young kids on mental health issues, they all deal with it very differently. Um, and, and that's a problem. And so what we see are these, these um, systems that are not dealing with these problems in a holistic way. And you can contrast that to some other countries. So I think some of what Europe is doing is great. Um, the Stanford Center on uh, Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing, they're actually working with governments in Northern California to stand up a system that's modeled after um, the way Australia and Canada um, works on these issues, youth mental health, and Australia's is called Life is for Everyone. Um, and what they do that's different is we have these systems where we send young people to crisis text counselors. And that's great, and that does a lot of good. But there is some point, especially when you're dealing with issues like suicide, where a young person has to get in-person help from a counselor, from a psychologist. Um, and there is no real system set up for that now. Uh, we just don't have that. I mean, the only way you're going to do that is if your parents take you to a mental health expert. But um, in Australia, they built a more holistic system where um, texting is integrated with um, physical centers where young people can go um, and then actually get in-person help. And so I think there's, there's, there's obviously a lot that has to be done by uh, governments and we're really lagging behind. One other thing I wanted to say is I think the point Hrefna made on resilience is one of the most um, salient points on this topic. So the latest research shows that the real way to deal with cyberbullying, this is what all the cyberbullying experts um, have realized, the, re the real way to, do it, to deal with it and um, it, to tackle it is to improve the resilience of young people. Um, but that's tough to do. Because to really improve resilience, you know, you need to let young people um, handle on their own a lot of these bullying situations. But when you're in the shoes of a company, you can't really do that because, you know, you have parents and media that will be really all over you and criticizing you, and that doesn't look good for your company. Um, and so we err on the side of taking things down. Uh, this kind of gets to the larger societal issue of helicopter parenting, but there's got to be something, you know, we can do. And we think about this in our app, like we want to build resilience, 
Um, but we don't have the answers. So just to finish, you know, we're not the experts. We need to, we try to work with academics and researchers and NGOs to figure out, you know, how to deal with some of these things where there's just not an answer yet. Well, uh, yeah, I was going to ask you to weigh in, but let me just frame something. And then I was thinking about Tumblr because you had mentioned uh, some of your, you talk about art and expression, LGBT community. It strikes me that you have a lot of, first of all, edgy content and you have a community uh, and it includes people who are somewhat marginalized, which would typically, there's a higher risk, LGBT does have a higher risk of suicide than heterosexual, for example. So I, I was curious about how Tumblr deals with all this. Well, one of the things, and, and Jeff, I feel like we've, ta we've touched on it, but I think part of this is, is company, are companies thinking about investing in the cultural shift uh, around talking about mental health. Like, I think that's the other thing here, and, and where we see a lot of artwork, where we see a lot of artists come on and they're using their artwork to express themselves, express their challenges around mental health and how they're really dealing with it, and it's, and it's often a helpful way, not only for them to think about how they're, they're treating themselves and, and, and getting help, but also how they're helping others, and it sparks all these these conversations, but I think what we're doing as companies is saying, hey, we want to make this a safe space for you to talk about every range of mental health. We want you to name it. We want you to find resources, but more importantly, as you find your own challenges, we want you to talk about it here because you can help someone. And I think by providing those, that space and those features, we're investing in this cultural shift around mental health that, that really needs to happen, but, but I think platforms need to be a part of that. And I mean, one, one good example that I, I'd want to mention that, that comes to mind, it's, very, it's specific to, more specific to suicide, but one of the partnerships we've done in the last year was with a film um, called The S Word, and it was about ending the silence around suicide, and it was actually focused on suicide survivors and their stories. Um, and it was about, we worked with them to develop content and really get that out on the platform because those, those are stories you, kind of like what we were saying where you can't always ask you can't always go, it's, it's so tragic, but you can't ask, like, what was the moment, what was the thing that really sent, sent you into, into this, such a dark place that you maybe resorted to self-harm? Uh, but being able to shed some light from these real survivors was a really uh, a powerful tool that sparked all these conversations. But um, I could talk about that forever. But the, the one thing I want to say that is just, I think that's how we really think about it at Tumblr is like we want to be a part of that cultural shift and how we talk about everything around mental health and just making this a, making our platform this safe space, but a space that often is the first place that people will use language um, to, to, it's been really interesting to watch millennials to Gen Z, like millennials I think would, you know, and our parents above us would talk more in loose terms like, oh, I'm feeling down, or I had a down year, and it would be very vague terms, and then millennials would, would start to name a little bit more, and then Gen Z um, kids are really starting to, to put names, I don't know if this has been your experience, but to be able to say, I'm, I am depressed, or I struggle with anxiety, they're really naming that, and I think that's something that platforms sort of need to go on that journey uh, with them. Well, Philippine, within, within among your peers, how common are these conversations? I mean, I think it's just life, so I think we kind of talk about it in general. Like when a friend is feeling depressed, they'll talk to like their really close friends. So I have friends sometimes that come up to me and just talk to me about self-harm and things like that because we just, we just need to talk about it and we're more comfortable talking about it with each other than with other people, I think. And then, um, I'm going to open up to the audience in a minute, but I want to open to the other panel if anybody have any additional comments. Uh, yes, you were talking about why should companies do this. I think it's pretty obvious that they have um, they have a social corporate social responsibility. So of course companies must take part in this as a part of society, really. And um, uh, well, the public sector should also do their part. They should review their policy on a regular basis and base that on evidence-based data. And they should be sure to provide adequate funding for research and education. But as I said, the corporate responsibility is a huge thing. And these two actors also need to work with the grassroots, the NGOs, the people who are working with 
the people in question. And I think it's also extremely important to ask children and youth, the ones we are talking about all the time, not just talk about them, but talk with them, ask them to find out the reality they are living in. And we actually did this in Iceland around yeah, 25 years ago or so. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the Icelandic prevention model, where we, uh, we were the worst in Europe uh, in relation to drug abuse and drinking among teens. But now we're the best, so to say. Uh, in 98, we were, there were 43% of 15 to 16 years old that had been drinking the last 30 days. Now it's 5%. And uh, sort of the recipe for that was uh, that everybody came together and collaborated, uh, the academia with research, it was evidence-based, everything was based on research because we were trying to understand the reality of teens. And I was a teen back then. <laughs> um, and then we had the discussion between all the different stakeholders. And the last thing, but not the least important, is that we did this on a community-based level. It was not a whole country approach, because you had research done in each community, in each municipality, and you used the data to work on the specific problems as near to the youth as you could. And this is the thing we are trying to sort of translate over uh, to uh, better internet use and also in trying to reduce anxiety and loneliness and all, the, all of these, these uh, challenges we face, we're trying to use the same approach. And the positive thing is that the newest numbers we have from Extra from 2018 actually show us that we had, had a steady upward trend in anxiety, especially with girls and depression, and it was correlated with the use of social media. But now it's been going a bit down. So we have some reason to believe that we're on the right track. And I think one of the most important things is that the discussion was opened up in society and everyone got on board, just like we did with the Icelandic prevention model. Monica, I'm putting you on the spot for my last question. Platform, but your platform has long prided itself on what's called real name culture. And so I was wondering if, you know, sort of, since we got the plug for anonymity, if you could talk a little bit about accountability and why you, Facebook finds that an important aspect of, the, of its platform. Sure. Um, we just believe that people are more responsible when they are their real selves online. And that, you know, and, and there are other apps. There are apps in our family of apps right. where people can use and not necessarily use a real name. But in Facebook, we believe that um, people will be more responsible and be able to be held accountable if they're using their real name. And thus, we're um, investing enormously, both in resources and, and people, towards removing fake accounts, because we know a lot of the bad content that is in our platform, still is in our platform, originates mostly from, from fake accounts. Um, but I just wanted to use the opportunity of the open mic to just address one last point, which is we, we, we would not be able to get anything right if we didn't work with um, experts. Um, we are not experts in um, suicide prevention. We have a full, a big dedicated team to that, but we rely on on uh, external partners, academics and civil society and psychologists and NGOs who work on these issues to work with us so that we can provide um, um, more safety and Facebook can be a welcoming place for everyone. Um, there is still a lot that we don't know and there's still a lot that experts don't know about. Um, and that's why we're pledging this year alone um, $1 million towards research. Um, to better understand the relationship between media technologies, youth development, development and well-being. I think that's, um, that's one area in which there needs to be more numbers so that we can work better. Um, and sometimes, you know, develop um, um, tools that might not be good for business, but they're good for safety. Instagram now um, and Facebook too allows you to track how much time you're spending on the app. So 
I personally never realized how much time I was spending on Instagram. And uh, when I looked at the numbers, which Instagram shows me in a, in a graphic, I was, you know, maybe I'm spending too much time on Insta. But um, I can now set a limit, and I've set that limit to 15 minutes per day of how much time I'm on the app. And um, business might look at us and say, well, it's not in your business interest, but I'm truly, truly proud to work at a company that can say we're taking this step because we believe that people will be more responsible if they know the limits and we're providing tools for that. So I'm no longer on Instagram for over 15 minutes a day, every day. Um, yeah, I'll close with that. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm just wondering, you, you say it might not be good for business, but isn't it good for business to keep customers happy and you have happy parents maybe and happy kids? So might that not be a good thing for business? No, absolutely. Um, and I think we need to look at business um, through a different lens. Um, our numbers, internal numbers, show us that uh, people are happier when they are um, engaging actively and not just passively consuming content. And um, yeah. We had a question for the audience or a comment. Go ahead. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Elina. I work for the Dutch government. Uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, coming. I'm really glad also to hear from uh, social media platforms uh, on this topic. Uh, I have a question concerning Facebook. Um, you mentioned that you were proud for, to work for the company uh, and that Facebook also really invests a lot in, uh, in humans, uh, in the people that work for the company. And then I'm wondering what you think about the Cleaners documentary uh, using uh, human moderators to remove harmful content. And what do you do to prevent suicide amongst this group? Thank you. That's a really good question. Thank you for asking. Um, we, we have a lot of people working on um, content that can be extremely um, traumatizing. So um, our policies within the company is to provide um, full support um, mentally, uh, you know, with the help of uh, psychologists and uh, having more time off um, to the people who are working with this. Um, and people choose to have these jobs. We would never say you now have to do that, but people, you know, I think that's one important thing to, to be clear. Um, I have personally been involved um, last year with um, a lot of material that involved, involved child exploitation. And I met a lot of mothers, I'm a mother, that choose to take that job and to look at those images because they believe that, you know, it's their way of contributing so that that material won't be in our platforms mm -hmm. again. I don't have the mental structure to pursue that job, but um, so first of all, people choose to do it and when they do, they have all the support, especially from human resources and psychological help so that they can cope. It's a really hard job and I, I'm, I'm extremely proud of the people who do that for us. Uh, thank you. Um, I also noticed that um, these jobs are carried out by people in uh, underdeveloped regions of the world. And don't you think that these people just see this as a way to get an income and that they don't really have a choice for this? So no, I don't see it that way. Um, we have people working in different regions of the world because we need to have people working on all time zones so they can, so th we can take action fast. Um, um, I, I would disagree with that point of view. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, women and men, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, hello, I'm Diana Her from Chinese YMCA. And in Hong Kong, there are a high rate of suicides, especially among our young people because of the academic result. And the media, and many media such as pa newspaper or news report keep reporting the case of the student community suicides. Therefore, students may misunderstand the information that the media want to tell the general public. It is also a common factor for leading suicides of children all around the world. And how should we deal with this phenomenon? Thank you.
Anybody want to take that on? Yeah. Uh, if I understand you right, I think you're talking about how we talk about suicide and how we call that's also a very delicate issue because discussion about suicide can, you know, go either way. It can make someone think about it or it can make someone open up about it. So we have to be very careful how we talk about suicide and we shouldn't maybe uh, paint the picture of the world too dark, like I said about the responsibility of media. There has to be a balance in what we're talking about because there are many, many good things in the world as well. And if we are taking a few cases and making huge, uh, huge uh, news about them, it might have a negative effect. So that's right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll just add to that. In the, in the US, we actually have um, guidelines for journalists on how to cover, how to write about suicide. Um, the, the problem is that not many journalists actually follow them. Um, Stanford put together a conference and yeah, it was difficult to get representatives from big papers. Um, but the kind of things that the guidelines uh, cover is um, that when someone's writing an article on suicide, they should be factual about what happened, but they shouldn't go into additional details about the person, but they should spend a lot of time providing information on resources that are available. There's kind of a debate among academics whether or not, um, yeah, it can be helpful or harmful to report on suicide. Most experts seem to think that uh, it's not beneficial to report on every suicide in a community because there's this follower effect. But, um, but yeah, I, I think you raise a good point. There, if the, even if there are standards that uh, not a lot of journalists are really aware of them or follow them. Sorry, last I think a one more, just one one more that I yeah. or one more point because I, I think this is super important and this is such a feels like such a small thing on this topic, but one of our organizations has really encouraged us to even talk about when we think of and talk about someone dying by suicide as opposed to committing suicide. I think even changing really down to very detailed things about changing how we talk about suicide specifically. I think using uh, the term died by suicide as opposed to committed, which is something that is often used in, in a lot of places and it suggests this is like a criminal act. Like that's a, a small but can be a very significant thing. I think changing the conversation and so you do, you're bringing up a really good point but I, I, I think it, there's some small things but I always want to mention that because as someone who had family members who did die by suicide, we often use the same use committed suicide throughout our family, and I think that's a small thing, um, but something that I think this uh, group of people um, can be a part of, sort of thinking about how we use the right vocabulary. The other thing is, it's not to not to glorify somebody who dies by suicide. Lady Gaga, the very famous singer, uh, several years ago in her concerts would put up pictures of young people who died by suicide, and then some experts uh, got in touch with her and educated her, and she's now completely changed that practice, and she has a much better understanding. Uh, obviously, you, you mourn the loss of anyone who dies, but you don't, you don't glorify somebody because it, it could have a contagious effect. Uh, the gentleman right there, you had your hand up. Thank you. My name is Kostin Boerman. I'm a software developer from the Netherlands, so I don't, I'm not an expert on mental health. But I see this trend uh, amongst platforms where um, Automatic detection of mental health issues is being deployed as a countermeasure for um, content. And in case a user I is flagged, so to say, they are guided toward, uh, towards mental health specialist. Is there the same priority for physical health instead of mental health um, to de detect whether users are, for example, spending too much time with a platform because I know for myself that when I'm on, on Reddit, I'd rather stay on the couch instead of uh, start exercising. And did the whole software industry um, compromise the, the, our users' health for, sure, for short term goals like impressions? Thank you. 
It's interesting. I sometimes wear an Apple Watch, which reminds me to get off the couch or the, or the chair and walk around. But it is an interesting question. I've never seen Facebook tell me, hey, you know, Larry, you've been sitting on your butt for the last 45 minutes um, posting. Maybe you should go for a walk. I mean, maybe that's something you guys can consider. That's um, great advice. We'll take it back to headquarters. Okay. We'll give this man uh, the credit. No, I think that, that is a, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I worked at a big corporation, and we'd have our computer remind us and, and lock us out of our keyboard, so we had to stand up and do exercises. And, it, you know, it seemed kind of silly at first, but it, it's, a, it's a good point. Uh, I mean, we, we on our app try to run positive campaigns, so we'll do things around body image and, um, yeah, physical health, mental health, uh, civic engagement. Um, but... You're, I think you're totally right. There's no emphasis on tracking, yeah, physical health, sitting there using the app like we do with the mental issues. So something we, being, you know, um, good corporate citizens, something we all should think about. Gentleman right there. Yes, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, sir. Uh, for for uh, floor, uh, my name is Andrei Sherbush. I came from Russia, Moscow Higher School of Economics. We had a, a big problem with the web issues concerning suicide uh, because we previously we had uh, like a, uh, a game of uh, in the social networks when uh, some uh, people uh, engaged children into committing suicide. It's called the blue whale. Like uh, you could read something. Uh, but um, uh, here I'm uh, more, most closely to maybe the legal issues. Uh, maybe uh, could we provide something, uh, some responsibility? Be because in Russia, <coughs> committing suicide, uh, uh, or uh, not the committing suicide, but to engage in committing suicide is the uh, uh, subject for uh, a blocking or extrajudicial blocking on the website. Uh, but uh, usually uh, the website blocking is more um, used in political maybe situations or uh, like to engage in political censorship, not uh, into proper, uh, uh, within proper. But uh, what do you think visually legal measures could be taken uh, to uh, prevent uh, suicides or prevent uh, like games like this in the social networks uh, without infringement human rights and freedom on, of the network. Thank you very much. I, first I want to comment very quickly on the blue whale. I've done a great deal of research on that and people have done even more research and aside from a few media outlets starting in Russia and then being picked up in India and other countries, we've been unable to verify whether it actually exists. And, and there are many uh, researchers who are questioning whether it is essentially an urban myth. Uh, there is the possibility that people actually have done follow-up as a result of the story coming out there. Uh, but the, it does bring up the broader question, th thank you very much, of what is the role of companies in making sure that their platform, and, and you addressed it a little bit, I, I think, on Facebook, but what is the, and Tumblr, the role of companies to make sure that your platforms are as healthy as possible uh, without censoring uh, free speech. Um, thanks for raising uh, the Blue Whale case up. Um, we have a, an expert in the audience, which is my good friend, Thiago Tavares. Thiago is the founder and president of uh, SaferNet Brazil. And um, he has followed up a lot on, um, there were, on, on um, the response for, from Congress to, to, the, to the Blue Whale. Maybe you, you should uh, chat later on. But what we did see is a spike um, because the media was talking so much about it. Yeah. If you were to look at Google Trends, there, there was a huge spike on searches for, uh, that, that were related to suicide right afterwards. So I think, um, you know, like journalism standards on how to talk about these issues are extremely important to be in place. Um, from, from our side, um, we, we were fast to act um, and to identify, you know, images that could be related to, to the blue whale, but Larry is extremely right. There hasn't been 
um, um, no, like we haven't been able to verify that there has actually been um, suicides connected directly to the blue whale, but we were aware of it and we worked fast to identify any any trends. But the, the, to Larry's point, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's the hardest job on Facebook. How do you, um, or any social media for what it matters, how, how do you balance free speech and having to remove content that can be harmful to, to your users? Sometimes we get it wrong. <laughs> we don't always get it right, but we're learning at, every day and we're, we're trying to do our best by our, by our audience, for sure. Thank you. Um, way in the back, you had your hand up, yes. Hi, um, I'm not gonna tell you my real name. I don't think it influences what my opinion is. Um, so people commit suicide, sure, when they're bullied and when they're influenced by the media, but people primarily commit suicide when they find themselves isolated, alone, and nobody to talk to. Um, now, Facebook would love to tell me to use my real name and to use a persistent identity so they can create a 10-year profile of who I am, serve me targeted ads, and maybe sell it to third parties when Facebook tanks. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's great from your perspective. Um, from the grand historical perspective, adults have failed to protect children, especially from things like sexual abuse. You're most likely to be sexually abused, uh, abused as a child by someone you know or someone in your family. It can be really hard to talk about that and to go on Facebook and to discuss that with your real name and your real identity. Like, uh, that, that's really hard for some people. So anonymity is very important. And I'm like one year older than a millennial and the first social network I knew was IRC. IRC was a wild and dangerous place but one went on IRC with an identity that could be burned. And if you started to be cyber bullied or if you had embarrassed yourself or if, if your identity was making you uncomfortable, you could just choose a new one and come back. And it allowed me to, to seek help for my mental health. And yes, I did meet these pedophiles that existed on the internet. And you know, he only knew me by a nickname. My IP was masked. And yeah, uh, it was no danger to me. It even had a chance to troll the person. So I, I really don't, I can understand how using real names makes people bully less and makes people harm others less. But the, the net, I don't see a net benefit for having a, a ban on real names on social networks. Well, and as I, I said, I don't use my real name on Facebook, and I only have to change it if I get in a fight with someone. It's well, also really you. unevenly applied. Thank you very much, and I think you illustrate the fact that there one size doesn't fit all, and there are many, many tools, and uh, m very happy that you spoke, and it's fine you didn't use your name. Yes, go ahead. So, I have a question for, I have a question for whoever wants to answer this question, because it, it seems like there's three types of experts here. That, I mean, their platforms. One, two platforms are anonymous. Two platforms aren't anonymous, and and then we have someone. So, so for you, I mean, I was wondering, when your friends do they reach out for help first to their friends? I mean, it's variety, or to a platform like Facebook, or well, they can't use Facebook, but to other platforms. And do they want to? You know, I mean, like with your friend, was she? Did she go to you first, or did she reach out? on the social media, and I'd be curious to see if After School and Facebook, like which one, and Tumblr, like who gets the most reaching out, like for, like what's the steps, like who do they contact first? So um, I thought that for my friend, she didn't really go on social media first. She, went, she wanted to talk to us, because I think she felt more safe, because I feel like the thing with the internet is you're not always, it's not always sure about anything. So I feel like when you talk to your friends, I think that in our case, maybe not for everyone, but she talked to us because that's how she felt more comfortable talking to. If I could just comment on this, because we often go into schools with uh, seminars for kids about better internet. And we also have seminars on bullying and friendship training. 
because uh, that's the new approach we're taking towards pooling, starting early with prevention, uh, to work with relationship, communication, and this friendship training and changing sort of the atmosphere in the classes. But often after we go into these classes, and especially when we have our youth panel uh, doing peer-to-peer -peer education, some, there are th often there are kids that come afterwards to talk to them and tell them about their troubles and ask, what can I do, or, or can you help me, or do you have any good advice? So the peer-to-peer -peer relation is really important, as you mentioned before. We just have time for one or two more questions. Way in the back, and then I'll get to you. Yeah. Way in the back, yes. Hi, can everyone hear me? Awesome. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Baldeep. Um, I'm an academic. I teach English literature at a university in Germany. Um, and I have two brief comments to make. Um, firstly, uh, so uh, this semester I'm teaching a course on uh, called Individual and Society in the Age of Technology. And this, this course, of the kind of momentum of the course is not to draw value judgments on whether um, digital technology is good or bad, but to really analyze and understand who have we become as people and society given these infrastructures. Um, so in the first lecture, I asked my students to write me and tell me why is it that they chose this course? Why are they here? Um, and these are students in their early 20s. Some are mm, around 19 or so. And um, something that was common to all of their writings was that when they were in high school and they were teenagers uh, new to the internet, uh, they were just absolutely confused by the entire space. They were bewildered. A lot of them faced mental health issues because of uh, being online. One of the students interestingly told me that she actually liked it initially because she could make an account on Instagram and post makeup photos and her classmates would never know that she produces that content because she didn't have to have um, her classmates as her, as her audience. But then she made a Facebook profile and Facebook linked her accounts and everyone in the class knew um, about her content on Instagram and bullied her about her makeup photos and videos. Uh, so I found that really interesting and it got me thinking and I feel like it's not enough to improve our online spaces. We also need formal segments, uh, lessons, trainings in high school spaces um, where we take out time, take out resources and really train students in using online spaces and technology because I feel like it's kind of like driving a car. If you don't know what you're doing, you will harm yourself and others on the street. Um, and I, I, some suggestions to what these trainings could do is, first of all, using social media for positive personal growth, um, lessons on being safe online, uh, making stronger passwords, uh, lessons on being anonymous online uh, without harming others, and reporting online abuse. I feel like a lot of cyberbullying boils down to microaggressions and online abuse that people ignore until it becomes too big. And um, kids need to realize that online abuse is real, it's valid, and it's something that can be tackled. And they need to know about legal and extra legal measures that they can take so that they don't feel like they don't have an alternative but to commit suicide. Um, and the second thing that I wanted to talk about, sorry, this is taking a bit long, but a great we area that I don't... We, we're actually just about out of time, so if you could right, finish okay. up real quickly. Thank you. Sure. No, I just wanted to point out a great area, uh, which is life after a suicide attempt. I don't think we've addressed that enough, um, because I think the support systems that you need for somebody who's thinking of suicide are very different from what you need for somebody who tried to commit suicide and survived. Okay. So if you could talk about that a little. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Jeff has an interesting statistic for the online poll that's going on. So Yeah, so we were running a live Twitter chat, and we were unfortunately couldn't share this live here because there was a system malfunction. But we had uh, over 100 people in the online chat, a bunch of suicide uh, act, uh, prevention experts. Um, so one of the questions asked was, can technology aid in preventing suicide among youth? 74% said yes. 12% said no, 15% said they don't know. So that's kind of a, yeah, interesting. And, and by the way, that's not just idle speculation. I know for a fact that there are people alive today because of social media networks like the ones represented in this room. And I've heard that from the uh, US National Suicide Hotline, that there's definitely uh, a great deal of help social media can do. But on the other hand, I have to applaud uh, Philippine for the help that she did for her friend. Uh, and, you know, I think we can deal with this problem. We can, so technology didn't create the problem. It can't solve the problem. 
but it, it, it can help. Uh, I want to thank everybody in the audience and thank the panel. Uh, I hope everybody learned as much as I did. Thank you very much.